in comics, the strips are often done by so many different writers. For a few months, there'll be one writer doing it, then another writer takes over, and then another artist takes over. So the characters are always pretty much in a state of flux. I really got into comics sort of by accident. I applied for a job at this publishing company, and um, I found out they specialized in comics. And I figured, well, I'll stay here for a little while and get some experience, and then I'll get out into the real world. But before I knew it, I was writing some of the stories, and I started doing some of the editing and the art directing, and it was interesting. And I was working with artists who were tremendously talented, and I thought, gee, this is fun. So before I knew it, it was 50 years had gone by, and I'm still waiting to get out into the real world. I'm really not sure why people relate Spider-Man and me more than other characters I've done. I, I guess maybe because Spider-Man is so popular. He's probably the most popular character we have. And he's been popular for so long. And I've always been so closely identified. I think I wrote the first hundred issues or more. And I think it's a little bit like, and I'm not comparing myself to him, but it's a little bit like Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse. Disney did so many things, but the minute you say Walt Disney, people think of Mickey Mouse. So the minute you say Stan Lee, the people who don't think who's he think of Spider-Man. The problem I had with superheroes was that I thought they were at the end of their run in 65. I thought superheroes had done their thing and they were, because Superman had died after seven or eight years in the 40s. And uh, every time we tried to do superheroes in the 50s, it sort of flickered out. So I had no, no anticipation that superheroes would last. I just thought it was another assignment that I would do and then something else would, I'd probably do westerns after that and science fiction after that. Never dreamed I'd be on superheroes for so long. I have come from a, a type of artist that isn't satisfied with their own work because I know what I want to see on paper and what I settle for is substantially less. And uh, you always think it's not as good as it could have been. And in fact, that's a good sign, healthy, because if you think you've gone as far as you can go, then you might as well hang it up. John Romita is the Norman Rockwell of Spider-Man. Like, he's the guy that when we close our eyes and you go, think of Spider-Man, it's his Spider-Man. And he did such a terrific job of establishing that and that was like around the mid-60s. By the time I get on the book, it's the late 80s. I think everybody was sort of frozen by his, the beauty of his drawing that nobody really updated it. And so everybody was just doing a, sort of a knockoff quasi version of John Ramirez to the point that he was still almost wearing bell bottoms and Mary Jane still had the straight hair and she's a supermodel now in the story. She's a supermodel and she still got that same hairdo from 68. So what I did was as soon as he donned the costume, then all rules sort of went away as to human anatomy and, and what was physically able to do because I wanted him to be a spider and I wanted to get the big eyes on him and I wanted more webbing on his face and I wanted him to go in these quirky positions and do, and to me it was about spider, spider, because that's the hero part of it and that's where I could have the fun drawing it. And so, and, and some of that quirkiness, yeah, Ditko did in the first 40 issues and that, and that was, that was sort of my, my thought process when I jumped on. I'm, I'm one of those guys who's read comic books forever. And when I was a real young kid, I started drawing my own comic. That's how my, my life evolved. I was started drawing in there, and then eventually I was publishing my own fan scenes. And I went from there to actually getting work in the comic book field, and eventually working on, you know, Spider-Man, which was a, a, a great book to be doing. You know, it was a weird thing, because I was following Todd. Todd was immensely popular on Spider-Man book. Sort of the expectations were that sales were gonna go down when I took over, because this, you know, just following the hottest guy in comics. And as it turned out, sales went up when I kind of started taking over the book. So it, it was it was a great time, you know? And when Todd came back and was doing the other Spider-Man book, I was still on Amazing, and things just went insane. Most of Spider-Man's visual identity comes from the original Steve Ditko stuff. His, his, his stuff was so deliciously quirky, and it was just perfect for the character. And John Romita brought a, a, a level of 
kind of a, a glamour to it that took it to another level. And if you mush Steve Ditko and John Romita together, you kind of end up with what I was trying to do for Spider-Man. Sort of the, the great achievement of my life, of course, was becoming a comic book professional and finally getting to work for Marvel. The challenge is to, to figure out how much you can keep as opposed to how much you can throw away. And uh, luckily, in the case of Spider-Man, the original form was just so well thought out that it was really just a case of miniskirts and modern hairstyles to, to update it. I think I've done Spider-Man longer than anybody um, in cumulative years, probably about 14 years. From 80 to 83, I, I started doing Spider-Man when I really wasn't as good as I could have been, as I should have been, to do the character. At the end of the run, I said to myself, my God, when I compare this to what my father did and what guys before me did, oh boy, it's not that good. I hope I can come back and do it again. So I always had that urge to come back and do it again and do it again and do it right. And here I am doing it as a mature adult and still say, I gotta come back and do this right. I gotta get it right someday. Cause there's always, uh, I'm, I'm perfectionist on my own stuff and I, I, I've never reached that point where I'm happy with it. So the way I approach things is I can't compete with my father. I can't compete with John Buscema. I can't compete with Jack Kirby. Even today, if I compare myself to my peers and my contemporaries, I'll go nuts. There's guys who are better illustrators than me. So I, I have to play to my strengths. I'm relatively quick and I have a, a good sense of storytelling. And those are the first things you concern yourself with. And then the art comes almost last. Tim had wanted to explore Spider-Man graphically and at a particular time in Spider-Man's life. My connection with Spider-Man was not quite as boyhood idol kind of thing. I enjoy the character a great deal, but there are certain things about writing him that's very difficult. Uh, more difficult than some of the other characters that I've done. So we settled on a particular time period, uh, which happens to coincide with when Mary Jane first came into Peter's life. And if I could build an entire series around uh, Face a Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. That's sort of where we began. It was actually the period where I, uh, the period in the comics where I first discovered the character, the early Ramita issues, as opposed to the Ditko issues. It had always remained my favorite era, and in deciding, in, in being given the opportunity to do a Spider-Man story, uh, you know, Jeff and I have a history of retelling early episodes in careers of superheroes, and this was my favorite career, and so now I'm struggling like crazy to draw pretty girls and, you know, to, to emphasize what was emphasized in that original run and yet have it still be what I do. The goal of Ultimates was to introduce new readership to Spider-Man and hopefully formulate a bridge for those readers to then come into the regular Marvel Universe. I think that's worked out beautifully. Ultimate Spider-Man is what he should be. He should be a teenager in the year 2001. And uh, as you know, for the past 40 years, as, as our creative community have got, has gotten older and our fans have gotten older, we've let the character age. What we were able to do with Ultimate Spider-Man is is bring out the cues that kids are used to. In 1960, it was really cool to work for a newspaper. In the year 2000, it's much cooler to be a webmaster. A chemistry kit in the basement, that was standard operating equipment in the 60s. Nobody knows what a chemistry kit is now. It's not the thing that you need. So there were a whole bunch of updates that related to modern cues, what school life was like, etc. But what we really did is what the movie does, is we take the teenager and we make him a teenager. Back in the 60s, it was sort of like, you know, Revenge of the Nerds is kind of what we envisioned Peter Parker as being. Whereas today, the shift is more of, he's not a shy kid, but he's more of a brooding kid. And that slight shift, I think, really hit a vein. And I think also what happened was that, that it, it was a, a testimonial to the character and how forgiving Spider-Man fans could be. Because we thought that the character was dying on us. We thought we were losing him. And then we realized, you know what, the fans were just waiting for something good to come around. And the minute we gave them good Spider-Man, bam, there they were. Stan Lee calls me in. I was doing Daredevil. I had done about three or four issues of Daredevil. And uh, Stan Lee called me in and asked me, uh, what do I think about doing Spider-Man? And being a, an artist for hire, I said, sure, I'll help out. You know, I thought I was doing it temporarily. So that was my strangest strangest twist was that I thought I was doing it temporarily and ended up doing it for for seven years in a row and intermittently for 25 years, 30 years. I didn't like him at first because he was beating up on Daredevil. I remember that vividly, that, wow, this guy's a bad guy. 
what my father had explained to me, he's kind of a, uh, he's a good guy, but nobody really likes him. The cops are after him, and the newspapers don't like him. So I had this opinion of him, kind of a, uh, an anti-hero. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I, I, I knew what I felt about him. So when my father started drawing him, I always knew that he wasn't well-liked, and that was such a strange feeling to me. He's a superhero, but the cops don't like him. The cops are after him. And then when he takes his costume off, he's doted on by his aunt. And then he lives just not too far from us, because we were living in Queens at the time. He lives over in Forest Hills. No kidding. Wow, let's go past it. You know, my father drove me past the area. Uh, that was, it was a, a, a live guy to me. It was a, an actual person, because I was at the age where it was, I was very easily affected by it. It was wonderful having an extra brother and one who didn't make fun of me. I first met Spider-Man when I was about uh, 13 years old. Uh, I missed his initial appearance in Amazing Fantasy, but I got the first issue, Amazing Spider-Man number one. And I was kind of blown away that here was a guy who was about my age being a superhero. My earliest memory was my father telling me that I had to go and pick up this comic book called Spider-Man. It was the Spider-Man drug issue, okay? And uh, which, which, you know, you read it today and it's, it's, it's pretty quaint. But, uh, but back then, my father thought that this was gonna have a real big impact on me. You know what I mean? It's, it's this anti-drug, anti-addiction kind of comic. And yeah, well, guess what? It kept me away from drugs, but it started a whole new addiction, which was comic books. At first, it was just the costume. I thought the costume kicked ass. I mean, it just had this giant, you know, two giant eyes uh, that, that, that you couldn't see through the mask. and. Uh, he was always, always kind of spider-like. He was always crouching or hanging upside down or uh, crawling up a wall. He just kind of did different things than you would see guys like Superman or Batman doing. It'd probably be, you know, the uh, cartoon show on TV. It, you know, me and my brothers used to get up early and watch it. And, you know, it's one of those theme songs like other TV shows you have that are just emblazoned into your, your memory bank right now. The first time I ever picked up a superhero comic book, it was Spider-Man. And I remember very clearly because I had gone home, I must have been like four, maybe five. I had gone home in that afternoon on a show called The Electric Company. They had a Spider-Man segment. There was a dude running around in the Spider-Man costume. And during those segments, he would just have thought balloons. He wouldn't speak and he'd have adventures against people who used poor grammar. He's, he's kind of us trying to be a hero. He's you or me trying to be a hero. He has all the foibles, the problems, making rent, uh, the secret life, the parts of himself he has to keep to himself. But he doesn't do that in a dark and brooding way. Spider-Man, there were moments of darkness, and there were moments where maybe he was on somewhat of a bleak precipice. But the thing about Peter Parker that always stayed with me is that he never lost his sense of humor. Even in the middle of the chaos, he was always making wisecracks. He, was, he could always look at the sunny side of things. There was one scene once where he, um, I love this scene, where he had received the check as a reward for doing something, and it was made out to Spider-Man. So he went to the bank to cash the check, I think it was $1,000 or something, and uh, the, um, the bank teller said, do you have any identification? And he said, well, what do you mean identification? Look at me, I'm Spider-Man. And she said, anyone can wear a dumb Spider-Man suit. I need an ID. Well, he didn't carry anything in his pockets, and he couldn't tell you who he really was. So this poor superhero with his $1,000 reward couldn't cash the check. He was, he was a flawed human being. He, you know, he, he was a nerd, didn't really know what life was about. And, and all of a sudden, boom, you get hit by a bolt of lightning, or in this case, bitten by a radioactive spider, and you got superpowers. And so it, it, those are actually, for me, more interesting stories to go, well, here's somebody who doesn't even know how to get through a nine to five day let alone try and come up with world peace, because now he's got superpowers. Peter's problems were really practical. They were, you know, I don't have enough money in order to go on a date, if I could get a date, and if I had someone to take to a date. I mean, and it was just at that level that Peter existed. He was the typical kid, you know, doted on by his aunt, got snot beat out of him all the time, got colds. You know, his, his costume wouldn't fit. The first couple fights, he actually got shellacked, if you actually read them. He actually didn't know how he was supposed to be a hero. And it would, and to me, being a hero is sort of like a job. You have to grow into it. 
and, and those early issues, he was very naive. I, I tried to get stories where sometimes the world was in danger unless he could get to a certain place and stop the villain. But at the same time, his aunt was ill, and if he didn't bring her her medicine, she might die. But they were both in different directions. He was only one guy. What would he do? And I loved those kind of problems, and how would you solve it? I love Doc Ock. One thing I love about him is his name. I like nicknames. So I originally called him Dr. Otto Octavius. And then I thought, well, it's, he'll have a nickname. We'll call him Dr. Octopus. But then as I started writing it, I started calling him Doc Ock. And man, I really related to that. Doc Ock, that's great. My favorite Spider-Man villain is Dr. Octopus. Uh, I just think he's a terrific visual. He's just a lot of fun to draw. There was a lot of stuff I really wanted to do with Doc Ock. In fact, I, I always made a conscious thing to have him the, as a character not particularly involved with the fight, so he would be pouring himself a cup of coffee or whatever, and his arms would be kicking the crap out of Spider-Man. Probably the Kingpin, who can conjure up any kind of supervillain thug that he wants to fight for him because of all the money he's got, but I love the Kingpin as a character. Well, I was less concerned about the Shocker, you know, who just went and sort of zipped you, than I was about the, the, the rogues gallery that would be like, again, the bug fighting, you know, a rhino, you know, or the bug fighting a lizard or something. Then it became sort of this animalistic sort of fight. I love the Green Goblin. I love Sandman. I like the fact that he could turn into sand and go under the doors and do all those things. And, and he could take the sand and make it rock hard and punch you. For me, it'd probably be Mysterio. I, 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 Mysterio is a terrible villain with a great looking outfit. But it's great looking because it's just so bad. You know, it's basically a dude with a cape and a green bodysuit of sorts. And he's got these two buckles that hold the cape on that have eyes on him. And then over his head, you can't see his face. He just has this dome. The Goblin made it personal. The Goblin went through the trouble of finding out who Spider-Man is. Uh, I guess Spider-Man early on uh, really kind of uh, busted up a lot of uh, the Green Goblin's early gigs. He uh, just kept stopping them, and the Goblin was just kind of fed up, so he just followed him home one day. <laughs> and uh, he dulled his spider sense, his danger warning sense, and he, uh, he followed Peter Parker home, or followed Spider-Man home and changed it to Peter Parker, and he knew where he lived. He, he knew his name, he knew everything, and uh, ever since then, he had one up on practically every other Spider-Man villain. Uh, he knew who Spider-Man really was. If you want to write stories that resonate and kind of come home to people, you write about a city that exists. You write about streets that exist, and Spider-Man has always been great about that. I lived in, in New York and in Manhattan, and I knew it so well, so it was easy for me to try to keep these fantasy stories as realistic as I could. And I didn't mind saying he lives in New York City, kind of like that. I think Gotham and Metropolis, being imaginary cities, made it harder to identify with the characters. They were always somewhere else. It was not contrived uh, thinking that that was going to make it even better. It was just one of those things that Stan wanted to try, to make a real city. And it helped us because we had real locales to locate. We could put local bridges, we could put the airports, you know. It was a big help to have reference instead of creating the city from, from scratch all the time. I've met people who talked about wanting to move to Forest Hills when they grew up based on having read that's where Peter Parker lived. And that's a little extreme, but it, 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 it's a real place, you know, and, and, and kind of building a tale or building, a weaving a mythology around something that exists rather than just kind of creating it and making it up. I don't know, there's something about it, something kind of special about being able to identify with the story, and, and I think that's what's always worked about Spider-Man, is that identity factor. It's a great pot with uh, all these different ingredients, and that's what Spider-Man is like. That's what the superheroes that live in New York City are like. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have that, sa that, that same flair to it if it wasn't New York. You know, we, we've always been very current, we've always been very topical, so, in my mind, to avoid 9-11 was almost callous and, and, and pretty cruel. So we were thinking that maybe it should affect one of our characters. One of our characters should, should be involved somehow or affected somehow directly. 
And the first thought was Spider-Man, obviously, because he is, aside from being our icon at Marvel, our most significant icon, he is our everyman. So we asked Joe Straczynski if he would like to write something for 9-11, whatever it may be. I gave him a real quick call and just said, you know, don't you think it would be odd if we didn't have something to say about this? JMS said, uh, give me 24 hours to think about it. So went home, the next morning come in, best birthday ever. There's a full script sitting there. It was a knockout punch. I think it was at that moment that I realized that the creative team I had were really onto something special. I was told that Straczynski was coming up with a, a script for an issue of Spider-Man that it was in the regular line of issues. Somebody said to him, why aren't you doing anything about the trade centers in Spider-Man? And he said, because there's no words. And those words triggered something in him. And he went back to his trailer while he's working on a, on a, a movie or something. And two hours later, he came up with a script. After I read it, I realized it was the right thing to do. It just absolutely broke me up. I, I cried like a baby. After crying for four days after the attacks, it was the same reaction. This is beautiful work, and this has got to be done. Getting all the reference and doing the book, and illustrating it properly, took more out of me than I suspected. I was aware when he took on the job that it was going to be a killer. I only did one, one pin-up poster, and it depressed me for a week. And he took a, a very difficult story on. It took him like three times longer than usual. And he needed to talk to me because it was actually depressing. I mean, we were on the verge of tears working on these things. So it was a very difficult time. I don't know how he did it. I, not only to, to do it as well as he did it under those conditions where it was almost like breaking his heart doing it, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to turn out a quality piece with all of the emotions that were going on in those pages. Those words that Uncle Ben had mentioned to him, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, I think really stood with Spider-Man. And to this day, he still lives with that responsibility, that he's got the ability to make a difference, and he's going to make a difference. There's a character called Ezekiel in one of the issues of Spider-Man, who is basically uh, has the same powers as Spider-Man. And he asks Peter Parker, why didn't you capitalize on it the way I did? I made some money and I'm putting this money to good use. And that's a question that Peter Parker, Spider-Man at the time, has to answer. You know, I, I had to do this kind of thing and I had to do that kind of thing first because of my Uncle Ben. Well, the, the key phrase is, has always been, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that sums it up. And I don't know how Stan, where Stan got that, but he was almost in the original concept. In other words, when you get these gifts, if you don't use them properly, you've, you've betrayed the gift you got. I think that's the, the, the single most vital core element of the character is somebody who's handed these great powers, who's not ready for it, he's not Superman, he's not born to it, he's not Batman, he hasn't trained for it, and he goofs up, he messes up, he messes up big time, and he learns a very, very powerful lesson. And, and it, it shapes his whole character from that point on. I think the, the moral couldn't be summed up better than, than with great power comes, must come great responsibility. And, and they're kind of words to live by. You know, it's, it's, it's a real do unto others. Batman doesn't have a real kind of simple boil it all down to this one phrase methodology. For me, it's about guilt. Peter Parker has power and responsibility, but ultimately he has guilt. He'll never, ever quite make it. That freedom is elusive. Great power and great responsibility, they certainly resonate, and certainly responsibility grows out of this guilt that he has. But for me, it's the G word, guilt. I think it's just, just the same sort of everyday virtues that we've all been taught, you know, as we grow up. And, but I think the beauty of Spider-Man, of course, is that, that he is every man, every woman. It's that mask, you know, it's colorless, it's, it's genderless, it's just a mask with somebody cracking wise underneath it. And, and that can be any one of us, you know. What the moral is, I, I, you know, again, there's a million morals that, that you can walk away from that. But I think the, the underlying message is that um, any one of us, you know, given a small bite from a radioactive spider, could be Spider-Man.